Hello everyone, um, my name is Michelle Woods. Um, I'm at the State University of New York, New Paltz, and I teach in an English department. Uh, but I guess I consider myself a translation studies scholar and um, I've published three books on translati translation. Translating Milan Kundera, um, Censoring Translation, which is Censorship Theatre and the Politics of Translation, which is about Václav Havel and the translation of his plays. And also last year, Kafka translated how translators have shaped our reading. There's long titles. Who needs them? <laughs> uh, uh, so I've so I published that, uh, and mainly on Czech, um, and Czech uh, literature and film and the subject of translation. So that's my background. Also, I'm going to do a bit of a sales pitch. Please. Uh, Brian's we book, which is amazing, which is called, uh, that he's finishing for Monday, which is called um, uh, Translation and the Making of Modern Literature, is going to be the first book in a new series which Bloomsbury are going to be publishing. Uh, myself and Brian will be editing. Um, and it's going to be uh, basically a series for literary and cultural uh, translation studies. So if any, anyone's interested, I've got a handout. We're going to formally announce it in a couple of weeks once we have our logo, which seems to be super important to the publishers. Um, <laughs> but if you're interested, I've got a handout. And you know, coming up to me afterwards, we're looking, we're actively looking for book projects. So if you're interested in that, so yeah. Wow. Well, that's wonderful. I feel like everybody already has a reason to be here. So yeah. <laughs> just for that inspiration, and that's, yeah. that's totally okay. Uh, I'm Abiyya Kosher. I am not a translation studies scholar. I think that's fair to say. Um, I'm a writer. I do write a lot about translation, about living between languages. Um, my book will be out August 25th. It's called The Grammar of God, A Journey into the Words and Worlds of the Bible. So definitely spent a lot of time thinking about uh, translation. And I think as many people in this room know, I write a lot of essays and reviews uh, on translation. Uh, Wilson Quarterly, Harvard Review, Iowa Review, uh, The Jerusalem Post, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And I teach at Columbia College Chicago in the MFA program in nonfiction. And there I designed a, a graduate translation workshop specifically for nonfiction writers. So that's what I will talk about, how I use theory in that classroom. Okay? And now, Turn it over to Michelle. Thanks very much. I have a handout. I'm not going to read this paper. I've, I've written it because it was helpful to me to kind of put down my thoughts. And I have some great quotes from my students, kind of uh, reactions to translation theory. So, so just bear with me. But I am going to talk about <coughs> it. So I have a little handout. Um, there's not enough for everyone because I thought only three people would come. We to the <laughs> uh, so, I, I so if you could share. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, I'm so, <laughs> yeah. I thought theory would just scare everyone. Yeah, I thought there was no one here. <laughs> So if I can, um, just if you could share, maybe, um, that would be great. Uh, it's just one sheet. So, um, so basically, I want to talk about a class I taught last year, uh, which is the first time I got to teach uh, translation theory. Uh, I've been a professor of English for, this is my seventh year. Um, and obviously, I've been teaching mainly English classes. And I was figuring out for that, that time how to bring in, I've taught kind of translation light. So for instance, I taught a survey course, Beowulf to Milton. And you know, I'd always talk about the translations. We'd looked at uh, what James Heaney wrote about Beowulf. We'd look at different versions of Marie de France. Um, uh, Chaucer. We'd read Boccaccio to see how he translated Boccaccio into the wife of, uh, sorry, uh, the Clerkstown, and so on. Um, but I never got the chance to teach to teach translation theory because how do you do it to to how do you teach it to English students? My students are English majors. And part of the problem with uh, my college is that they come to theory itself, full stop, very late, usually in their senior year, because we have a lot of um, uh, people coming in from community colleges who are then entering uh, SUNY four-year college. So we don't have a kind of basic first year, here's theory course. So A, I'm teaching monolingual students for the mo most part with bad language educations often. Um, uh, translation theory without any basis of kind of any theoretical training. So I had to really think long and hard about how to do this. It was a 400 level course, so they, they are kind of, uh, they're more experienced students, um, but it's a 35 person class that I run as a seminar. So we're talking to like a huge wow. amount of people, which is the normal for 400 level classes, a bit crazy. So you can see what I was up with, right? Up against, I should say. Um, so what I decided to do was to teach a literature class with theory. I wanted them reading uh, literature so they had a connection. I didn't want to just go in and teach a class on translation theory because I don't know where that would have gone. Um, and what I basically did was a fairly standard um, set of texts from Russian and Czech because I can read Russian and I'd written on Czech 
literature and translation. So we read Anna Karenina, Crime and Punishment, which they hadn't read before, right? These are students who, they might have read notes from the underground, but that's it in terms of Russian literature. So this is really the first time they're coming to these texts. Um, we did Chekhov, we did The Seagull, Akhmatova, we looked at her poems, Cycle Requiem. Uh, we looked at a couple of Kafka stories, Václav Havel, his one-act play, Protest, and then uh, Kundera's uh, Book of Laughter and Forgetting. Wow. Um, so what I did was, in my uh, syllabus, was to teach these, but in between, get them to read theoretical essays mm. or essays on the translators uh, that we might discuss, right? Um, did it work? I'm not so sure. Right? <laughs> I felt it was very hard. By the end of the course, I was convinced it was a disaster, I have to say, because it felt odd moving from talking about Anna Karenina one day to suddenly talking about um, gender and the metaphorics of translation the next day. Um, I, I did get great evaluations, which really surprised me because I didn't get that fee I didn't get that sense from the class. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's one of those things where you end it and you go, "What did I do?" Um, but the, but they they seem to get a lot out of it. I think. Um, so what I did to start off the first the very first class, and it's on the sheet that I handed out to you. I we we did the whole formalities. This is what you're going to do in this class. But I got them to do a group exercise, which is to look at the same passage in Anna Karenina in four in three different translations the Maud translation, the Garnett translation, and the more recent Pavir and Volokonsky translation. And I didn't set them up for it. I just said, have a look at these, what do you notice about them? Um, and I was kind of surprised. I was surprised at how uh, you know, they got into it as an exercise. Um, but they were fairly astute. They realized that the, the kind of differences between them, I didn't put the um, bold, I didn't bold the repetitions in it. Um, but I said, you know, uh, have a look, you know, see what you think. Uh, and it was interesting, some of them thought the Maud translation was more elegant, more fluent, and they really responded to that, which is kind of how we expect kind of people who haven't thought about translation to maybe think, you know, oh, it sounds more English, it sounds the way it should do. Um, but then some of them did say, well, look, there's the rep repetition of this word, um, enchanting, and uh, I forget what it is in Pavir and Volkonsky, I forgot. Fascinating. Fascinating, fascinating in the, um, and enchantment in the Pavir and Volkonsky. And it was a great way of, you know, I said, why, why is it there? You know, why, you know, is, is this a good way to translate it, do you think? And some of them were like, no, we want it to sound more English. And some of them were thinking, well, you know, uh, it's interesting. You know, there's some, some reason for it. And of course, it's a very famous scene from Anna Karenina where Kitty, who's in love, love, love with um, Vronsky, uh, goes to a ball. And her aunt Anna has arrived, who's this beautiful woman. And she's so excited. Kitty's like, whoa, a ball, this guy, my great aunt. Uh, and she's looking at Anna, thinking how enchanting she looks. But th in that paragraph, she moves from looking at Anna beside Vronsky, going, oh, she looks so enchanting, she looks so enchanting, seeing her interact with Vronsky and realizing by the end of the paragraph that Anna and Vronsky have made a connection. Mm. And what's beautiful about it uh, is that Tolstoy is using this proto-modernist uh, method of, of, of uh, you know, this kind of uh, repetition, and this kind of you know, bad style, in a sense, mm -hmm. to kind of see us, see this enchantment happening by repeating the very word, right? So it was a great way when they went, oh, God, he meant to do that, right? There's a, there's a reason why a translator might go, it's important to translate this repetition, because there's, a, there's an aesthetic reason for it, there's a stylistic reason for it. But it was also a great way to introduce Anna Karenina for me to say, look, it's a 19th century novel, it's a great story, but it's also got this kind of proto-modernist element to it. Not only Anna's stream of consciousness when she's going to, well, she's not going to kill herself, she's going to the train station, um, but that's where she kills herself, um, which is seen as this, always quoted as this, well, this is you know, pre-Joyce, but look what's happening. There are other elements. We've got a dog, Laska, we get it into its head at one point. Um, and... Um, you know, uh, and various other stuff in there where you can really see it. And one element, one thing that's very hard to teach about Anna Karenina is the boring bits, right? Because, of course, they respond, they're like, oh, Anna, Vronsky, it's great, the melodrama. But, you know, teaching them that actually it's the stylistics that are kind of the interesting thing. And um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the kind of um, uh, rhythm of the novel has to have not only the melodrama, but also the second story of Levin, uh, you know, to kind of... Uh, uh, ground the melodrama in some ways. Um, and also things like uh, Levin's famous mowing scene, which the students hate. They're like, what are you reading about mowing? <laughs> and you know, it's tradition in traditional kind of literary studies has been read as country versus city, you know, the simple peasant life, Tolstoy's philosophy, etc. 
But in fact, when you look at the Moan scene and look at the syntax, it has a Moan rhythm. And so this idea of what Tolstoy is thinking about is, is stylistic as well. So it's a great way to kind of go, there's more to this than this fantastic story. And of course, they really enjoyed the story, but they opened their eyes. By thinking about translation, it opened their eyes to reading, to reading really well, right? Um, so, uh, so that was that, that, that introduced them to that. Um, we, but in between, so we stopped, we read a few chapters, and then we read a couple of um, things about Constance Garnett. Although we were reading the Pavir and Bolkonsky version, uh, I wanted them to read about a female translator uh, who's, uh, you know, who had this fascinating life but was translating at a time when women didn't have as much access or as much uh, kind of respect as literary figures, right? Um, uh, one from Sherry Simon's book, Gender and Translation, and one, an older book, uh, kind of old school kind of book by Carolyn Heilbrunn. Um, and they're really interested. It really opened up this question of who the translator is. And so I just want to quote a blog. They had to blog through the course. Um, so one student said, learning about Garnett took, a little, took the little education she had as a child and moved up in the world to be self-sufficient and of course about how she managed to make such a huge impact in the literary world was truly inspiring. Thinking back to Garnett, she was translating mostly male writers and it does not seem that her being a female makes much of a difference to the translations at all, which is something we talked about then in class. Another student said, I never gave much thought to those who translated novels, largely because I was ignorant of the fact that someone had to translate various works. <laughs> that translators are a major part of the writing and publication process. Translation is an art form in itself and an underappreciated one at that. Um, so of course when we discussed the readings about Constance Garnett and translation and gender, I became much more grateful for the art of translation. What a truth there is to the notion that woman, women and translator are nearly one and the same. The idea that men are superior to women, that authors are superior to translators and so on. And it doesn't end there. The act of translation allowed women to involve themselves in literature, politics and public debate, a realm they were often restricted from. In the same blog thread, another student wrote, I had an epiphany this week. <laughs> Translators exist. <laughs> as embarrassed and ashamed as I am to admit it, the concept of a translator is not something I've thought very deeply about. I've been reading translated novels by Haruki Murakami, um, translated from the Japanese by Jay Rubin and Philip Gabriel for a couple of years. It never occurred to me that these men spent hours and hours slaving away at doing this incredible writer justice. And she goes on, she says, I remember thinking, why can't they translate it faster? Well, it's probably because they have lives outside of work. <laughs> they want to write the best possible translation. And I would assume they don't want to go blind like Constance Garnett almost did. <laughs> uh, the two articles we read for Thursday really put translation into perspective for me. I'm not sure what I was expecting from a literature in translation class, but I know I wasn't expecting to have a rapid and life-altering realization of the obvious in the first couple of weeks. I appreciate translators much more now, <coughs> and I look forward to reading this semester without taking translation for granted. Um, so you could really see, you know, so that was brilliant. I was like, yay, I've opened their eyes, right, straight away. Some of their eyes, not all of them. There, there were a few in the class who didn't. Um, but we did, so, so we went back to Anna Karenina and then we read Venuti's, you know, the obvious, The Translator's Invisibility, the first chapter from it, and Rachel May, the translator in the text, which is a great book about Russian, you know, the history of Russian, the translation of Russian literature. Um, I wanted them to think about what got translated when and why, right, the politics of translation, right, the kind of bigger picture. And I was really surprised at the robust, there was a really robust reaction to Venuti's work. So one of them said, I found one of the most surprising elements of this class to be that we not only read and discussed text in translation, but that we analyzed the process of translation as a force and a way of wielding power. I truly identified with the ideas of translation as a colonizing force, especially when this idea was, support, was supported by Venuti with statistics, which suggested that the percentage of books published in the United States that were translated from another language was only about 3%. When considering this, I thought that this might point to a society, i.e. America, that is stagnant. <laughs> another translator wrote, another translator, another student wrote, I found the discrepancy in the number of translations acquired from other languages into English compared to the number of translations other countries acquire of English literature shocking. It is frightening to realize the detrimental global effects translation publication has on the world, i.e. America. I know that economics plays a large role in the works publishers choose to publish, even more so than the quality of the literature, but I never considered the social and political ideals that also play a role in what is published or translated and how the work is altered. And finally, a sixth season said, every time we talk about translation theory and the entire culture behind it, I always find myself so amazed at the politics of translation and the other small details we so easily overlook. 
From learning that only 3% of literature published each year is translated, it makes a lot of sense that the content we choose is anything that appeals to our own egos. I firmly believe that a lot of the racism and prejudice that exists in our society comes from the fact that we severely misrepresent other cultures. We saw this in the example of the article that talked about how America did not or was publishing certain literature during uh, the McCarthy era, right, certain mm -hmm. Russian literature. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got another one. I don't know how boring this is, but another one. So reading these articles uh, made, me think, uh, made me think about how we perceive translators and translated literature. Before reading the two articles, I was much more partial to the idea of a translator that remained, to use Venuti's term, invisible one that stayed faithful to the text and translated it fluently. The more I began to think about it, however, I realized that such abs expectations are absolutely unrealistic. I actually found it somewhat unsettling that this subject, the role of the translator, and the impossibility of having a true translation is something that is not discussed more frequently. Having read Venuti and May's articles now, my perspective on translators has been drastically enlightened. I feel it's important for the readers to be aware that they are reading translated work because it makes the entire reading experience quite different. As we discussed in class, I think becoming more comfortable with translations can help us as readers become equally as comfortable with that which is foreign to us, a kind of maturation that can only serve to make us better readers. Um, so some, and someone else spoke of, you know, think of Fenuti talk about a trade imbalance. I find it extraordinarily tragic that our range of novels has come to be dictated by the hands of editors and publishers <laughs> who are merely <laughs> looking for the next bestseller according to American and British standards. So, that was, so at least it got them that, uh, that side. The only time that we looked at two different translations was when we got to Akhmatova, simply because of space. It's much easier to do with poetry. And we looked at D.M. Thomas, Thomas's translation, and Judith Hirsch, Hirsch Meyer's translations, right? And they were really shocked at how different they were. And I also gave them, because it's fun, uh, an essay by Brodsky, which is a re review of actually another translation. Uh, I think it's Kuz uh, Kunitz's translation. And Brodsky, in typical, this is terrible. She can never be translated. You know, <laughs> English will never see a true um, Which they found fascinating because, in fact, what, what I found fascinating is that they disagreed with Brodsky. They, you know, they said, "Look, we see what he's saying. You know, we understand. You know that." But one of them said, "I don't think that I disagree with him that there's someone at fault for this, i.e., the translator, and that the translator may tend to add some of his own poetry to Akhmatova's. It seems impossible not to, and I wouldn't necessarily consider his different interpre interpretation as someone's fault. And this is some of the thing we talked about in class, right? The different interpretations of." You know how they approached Akhmatova. You know, and of course it's amazing. And teenagers, they meet Akhmatova and they're just blown away, right? You know, it's just a brilliant thing to do. Um, but I thought it was great that they got to the level of sophistication where they weren't just going, "This is a better translation because I like it more," right? But they were thinking, "Oh, they've made these interesting choices, and what does that mean mm -hmm. in terms of how I read this poem?" Um, we then looked at Vanya um, and we read Susan Bassnett, uh, who's a good partial part of the chapter on. The English in Vanya, how he's become this English um, playwright in some ways uh, in, through translation. And I also gave them uh, a few pages from one of my books, Censor and Translation, not because it was particularly brilliant, I have to say, but it gave us a, a kind of pressy of the recent research on translation in theatre. And that really fascinated them, the whole idea that if a translator is translating for theatre, you know, the text is going to be changed again, and how that how it really struck them at that point how creative an act translation is. And they wrote about that too in their blogs. They were thinking about um, them as part of the theatrical um, uh, creativity, if you like. Then we did something more practical with Havel. I had done archival research for Havel's plays in his translator's archive, Vera Blackwell. And so what I did is I gave them, we read the play and we talked about it. And I was so, I was so happy that they weren't reading it as a kind of Cold War, the way it's been read. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's this Cold War, mm -hmm. you know, it's a dissident talking to someone who's collaborated with the regime. Uh, but it's actually a play about language. Havel's work is really about language and how someone you can self-justify your actions through language, how language kind of, we use language to, to persuade ourselves out of things, but at the same time, language kind of uses us, how we become prisoners of language. And they really got that. They loved the play, maybe because it was short. I don't know, I feel like sometimes <laughs> short and good. But I also, so I gave them, what I did first was give them um, Blackwell, uh, it had been adapted for the National Theatre in 1980 in England, and the guy who adapted it radically cut the play, there's a very long uh, speech monologue where the guy who's the collaborator figure, he, he persuades himself essentially to, you know, not to sign a petition, and to, but it's this whole long, the long speech is so central to it because we see him 
you know, kind of justifying this position, moving back, going forward. I mean, you really need it. It's aesthetically central to the play. Uh, but the guy had gone, yeah, it's boring. How can you stage that and just cut it out? Mm -hmm. So it became this really political play. It's about a dissident and, and, a, and a collaborator of the regime. And the translator of Blackwell, she wrote this, this place called Protest, and she wrote a protest saying, look, you've, you've turned him into this mildly amusing bastard, she says. You, know, but you, haven't, you haven't understood the play. And they really responded to reading about the translator's kind of issues. Mm. And because we talked about the play, they'd read it, they were like, yeah, she's right. This guy just didn't get this play. And they're really amazed by that, and that was great. Then what I did the next class is gave them a set of reviews from a 1983 uh, production in New York at the, at the Public Theatre in New York. Um, and they're all good reviews. It got, it got kind of terrific reviews and really widely re widely reviewed, which of course now the papers don't exist. It's very sad there aren't going to be that amount of reviews. Um, and I just put them into groups. I gave them four or five reviews each and asked them what they thought. And it's fascinating because the reviews read it completely politically. So they loved the idea the um, director had put um, uh, on the proscenium, like covering the proscenium, proscenium arch, uh, this thing with Cyrillic writing on it, and then there were tanks in the background and hammers and sickles, <laughs> right? And they, they, they were like, what is she doing? What, what, did the, what was this director thinking? And just the language of the reviews. So it really got them thinking about how, even after a play is translated, how it's then mediated uh, by another level of translation by the reviewers, right? And it was such a hands-on. So they'd taken the theory, the theory that they'd read and just gone, OK, this is, we can see it in action here. We can see these, the, this kind of, these prejudices and these kind of uh, uh, reductive readings happening before our eyes. So it's kind of good practical production. Um, and then with Condor's book, I also used archival material, letters between Michael Henry Hine mm -hmm. and who were thinking about a lot yeah. of this conference, and Condor, which I translated. Um, uh, parts for them, um, and I've got it. I think uh, maybe a little bit on the back of the sheet, um, and you know they were so they're reading these letters, which was great for them. And I had a kind of photocopy of what the letters looked like, so they could see it in check. So they had a sense of being in the archives without having to be in the archives, um, and um, they're really interested that Condor was talking about punctuation, which is one of my big <laughs> loves. Um, talk about translation, and um, you know, and so I want to give them uh, examples. Uh, about why, why punctuation is important. And I took this, this I think it's on the sheet, this um, paragraph from the novel, a couple of paragraphs uh, from the lithos section of the novel, which is about this untranslatable word, um, lithos, uh, what that Condor says is untranslatable, and co which Condor had rewritten himself. In a, in a newer edition of the novel, he'd taken out part of, part of the paragraph. But when we looked at that paragraph in detail, um, uh, you know, I showed them about why the punctuation in that paragraph was really important mm. and the syntax, the way uh, the syntax was written. And what, in fact, I think Condor thought was untranslatable about the syntax and the punctuation, which is why he rewrote it, why he took it out. Uh, so that was a really good way into thinking about prose as being you know, as dense, again, like the Anna Karenina, as dense as, as poetry in some ways. So by the end of the semester, I had really mixed feelings about the course. Mm. Um, they loved the literature. They really responded well in the classes we did in literature, less well on the theory. Um, there was a core of about 10 students who were just like, whoa, blown away by, the, by this idea of the theory and so on. Um, but, you know, there's 25 other students in the class, so, you know, um, what happened with them? I think in terms of theory, one practical thing I would do if I taught it again is if I gave them a theoretical article, I think I'd give them a kind of guided reading sheet. Yeah. Uh, with questions, saying, okay, so on page 20, so, you know, Laurie Chamberlain says, you know, um, when we talk about translation, we use all this uh, feminized language, right, so whatever, you know, so what do you think of this, right, so it doesn't have to be give me a right answer, but just to get them, to make sure they've read it, because I felt, certainly with this Laurie Chamberlain article, which is quite high, you know, high theory, um, that only maybe 10 of them read it, I think the rest began the first paragraph and were like, I'm not going to read this, right. And so I think there's a way, and I think it would have been better in terms. So in class, we covered it, and we talked about it. A student gave, gave a presentation on it, a very good one. But then I kind of went through the basics, right? This is basically what she's saying. But I hate doing it that reductively, and I think getting the students to do it themselves would have engendered much better discussions in class. So I think more guided, kind of front-loading uh, front it a little bit. Um, 
So that's the basic thing I guess I come away with. But I do think it did open their eyes about translation. Even the 20 who may not have blogged about it or ne may not have been op openly vociferous about it, I think they were like, man, we're reading this stuff in translation. There are translators. Uh, books aren't just published, but they get, they're get they chosen for a certain reason. Uh, cultures are reflected in translation. Like, so that kind of stuff, I think, was really great. And I think it gave them a somewhat ethical way in which to read translations. Mm -hmm. Not with the guilt, because we often give English monolingual, English lit students guilt about it, right? Go and read another language, or go, which I'd love to say to them, but you know, <laughs> it's, not, it's probably not going to happen. Although, you know, they may read uh, uh, Marquez and then go, I want to read Spanish. That's why I studied Russian literature. I read Tolstoy, I was like, I'm going to learn Russian. I did Russian and English at college. That's my one reason for doing it. I think people do that, right? Uh, so you have to get them interested in the first place, and I think that's part of it. Um, and I think, but I think, I don't want them to feel guilty all the time. I want them to think, oh, there's a translator. Who are they? I'll Google them. Um, you know, there are two different translations. Maybe I'll read another translation down the line, and so on. Um, I think, and not to think of uh, uh, translations as automatically bad, right, which tends to be sometimes their reaction. But most importantly, I think at least with some background in theory um, connected to these ex the more practical exercises, I think thinking about translation was a great way to teach English students how to read well and how to read closely. It's a way of getting them to read, uh, to connect the stylistics of the text, which they often don't want to, in high school they talk about theme and character and they're like, yay, I got that symbol. But they don't think about the language, right? The, the syntax and all that. And to think about how that, the great fun when you connect that, the, the commas and semicolons to the huge issues, the political and cultural issues that are connected to it. Why, why are texts shortened and so on in, in editing uh, practices, say, uh, in, especially in America and England. Um, and so that they can play with these huge issues, these political issues, but also really, really read well and closely I read the text, so sorry, that's my, that's my report from my class. I have to say, I don't know how interesting this was for you, but it was the first time I've ever sat down and really yeah. thought about a class I thought in that kind of detailed way, and it was brilliant. If I had the time, I'd do it all the time, just to think about mm. what went right and what went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So that's well, Michelle, thank you so much. That was yeah. super fascinating and super detailed, and yeah. took really, really, yeah, I loved your student comments I know, in particular. <laughs> Really, really wonderful to hear. Um, so first of all, I just want to express my gratitude to you for mentioning some of the politics, your, your politic, the, the politics of, of translation, because I think that's our conference theme and I think it's important to talk about. Uh, for, for those of us who are not translation studies scholars, I think just teaching a translation class, just getting it on the books, is a political act, okay? Mm -hmm. Just that right, right off the yeah. bat. And I'm happy to say I see uh, an alum of mine, a student in the back, and I ask my students in their evaluations to make some sort of comment, you know, if they'd like to see the course again, and that helped me for the second time around, you know, because the first time was a war. So I, I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, it's, important it's important to mention. And uh, so I think just the fact that we're sitting here is, is, is in some ways political, because it's not a given in many, in, in, in many uh, departments, especially not in, in all creative writing departments. Okay, so I think that m what I'm going to discuss is going to be uh, very different from what you're going to talk about, just because uh, you know, you're know you primarily a scholar and I'm primarily a writer. So of course I'm going to teach differently and of course I'm going to have a different point of view. Uh, so I teach in an MFA program for, again, for graduate students in nonfiction. And in everything I do, I'm always trying to think, how can I help students become better writers? Right? That's my number one thought all the time. Okay? So, um, and of course, I believe, and I think it's a, a political belief, I believe that translation is a key part of a writing life. That's what I believe. And I do believe that if you only read American literature all day long, you won't be that interesting. Right? That's, that's basically how I feel. And, and I recognize that it is entirely possible to get uh, an MFA degree in creative writing and read only Americans. Okay? It's very, very possible. Okay? And I, I feel like it's my personal mission to make sure that doesn't happen to my own students. Right? I want to make sure my students think about Poland once, okay? <laughs> that's all I want. All right, so that's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking. So um, I I teach this uh, graduate course. It's supposed to be the form and theory of literary translation, and I start the course uh, with the theory of translation and then the politics of translation. So what I thought I would do is talk a little bit about how I teach the theory, okay? How I introduce the politics of translation. 
and then just give you an overall uh, uh, overall of the rest of the course, right? And then we'll open it up to, to kind of make some general comments. And if you don't believe me, you can ask uh, Micah, who's sitting in the back, who actually listened to it, okay, for a different a different uh, different perspective. All right, so um, I begin my class the way Rosanna Warren, who was my teacher, began in uh, poetry when I when I did a poetry graduate degree at Boston University. And I believe very much, you know, in, in uh, Jewish tradition, there's medvita uh, b'shem okay, which means uh, a person who uh, gives credit to to someone brings. Uh, uh, um, how would I explain this? Uh, redemption to the world. Okay, so it's so hard to translate on the spot. <laughs> so I really believe, you know, that's the ancient rabbinical view that not to give someone credit, you're going against the redemption of the world. So I want to give Rosanna credit because I because she she was the first person who taught me uh, many years ago. All right, so I begin uh, with John Dryden, Walter Benjamin, and Robert Lowell. Those are the three. Okay, and. As a practical tip, what Michelle was talking about, I do a lot of reading out loud, right? Because I believe it's important for a writer and for a translator, okay? So for the Benjamin essay, for instance, I make sure we read the whole thing out loud, okay? Just as an example. It's difficult, all right? If you go line by line, you can have a real discussion about it, all right? Robert Lowell's essay is about a couple pages, maybe two pages long, no problem reading it out loud, and it's fabulous. Okay? And for Dryden, I always make sure to read the sections of where he says he, he has the his disease of translation, which is very famous. Okay? So the, the sections, uh, what it is, is it's uh, John, John Dryden's preface uh, to his translation of Ovid, but parts of, the, the parts of that essay are directly about translation. I always make sure to read those particular paragraphs out loud for a few reasons. Number one, I'm teaching writers. I want them to hear what Dryden's prose sounds like. Okay? It's important. I want them to hear how Dryden himself obsessed about translation. I want them to know that major writers translate. Okay, that's my goal. I want them to know. All right. I also want to begin the course in two important ways. I very much believe in reading primary texts, going to the source. Of course, I know that they can open a, a theory anthology, and there is one on the syllabus. And they'll have people referring to Benjamin, referring to Dryden, blah, blah, blah. I don't want that. I want them to read Dryden, Benjamin, and Lowell first. Struggle with it, break their teeth, I don't care. But I want them to have that first-hand experience before reading anybody else writing about it. Right? And, that's, and I feel very, very strongly about that. That's why I begin with Dryden. Okay? Dryden's essay, of course, was published in 1680. All right? And then Dryden, of course, is British. And I want to have three different countries in the beginning, right? Three different, three, so three different linguistic traditions, all right? So um, first we talk about Dryden, and invariably, the students, I've now taught this course twice, and I can tell you I've seen the same reaction twice, which is very interesting. In the beginning, everyone hates Dryden. No <laughs> one understands him. Why? Because, you know, frankly, most people don't sit around reading prose from the 1680s, especially if they're creative <laughs> students. So it's hard, it's hard, you know? But something happens along the line, and people get charmed by Dryden. Yeah. The, Dryden, you know, he's an acquired taste, okay? And, and then they get charmed. One of my students right now, her email signature comes from that Dryden essay. <laughs> <website. laughs> that made me so happy, okay? So I realized that she got it, you know? I think what Dryden outlines, like no one else, is how you can become obsessed with translation. And I think that's not a bad way to begin a course, to show people that you can get really, really, really into it. And you know who did get into it? Dryden. <laughs> so I think that's not a bad, yeah, uh, not a bad way to start. As, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, uh, Dryden lays out uh, three uh, possibilities for translation, okay? Paraphrase, metaphrase, imitation. But again, I want them to hear that from Dryden, not from anyone else, okay? And what we do is we discuss that at length. I don't care how long it takes. I want students to feel comfortable with the three options that Dryden himself lays out. And also, my other goal teaching translation, my goal is I want students to feel comfortable translating. That's what I want, okay? I don't want them to be scared of it. I, I, I want them to, to do it, okay? I don't want them to spend the whole semester reading about translation and not doing a thing. So what I love about Dryden is he, he offers three uh, options that disagree with each other, okay? <laughs> That's great. Three totally different poles, right? So first, there's a lot of Dryden. I don't care how long it takes. I want to feel that everyone in the room is comfortable before I move on, okay? So that's what I do. And then we read Benjamin 
uh, generally the entire thing out loud. Uh, Walter Benjamin, in my opinion, again, I'm a writer primarily. I, you know, I feel Benjamin is a marvelous essayist. I feel he's a writer. I feel he has been unappreciated in that way. Uh, again, I can credit the person who introduced me to Benjamin as the art historian Michael Freed, uh, who was my wonderful teacher as an undergraduate and believed that Benjamin's writing on art was brilliant writing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's how I began with Benjamin. Later, when I became interested in translation, I realized to my delight that Benjamin had also written on translation. But Benjamin is also someone who you need to spend time with to get. You can't run through. Uh, this year, I had an interesting experience. I'm teaching a small class. I have seven students. And I got the feeling that, that they didn't get Benjamin. So you know what? I spent a second week, I spent two weeks on one Benjamin essay. I don't care. I think it's an important essay, all right? I want them to get it. I want them to understand. I want them to think about the idea of translation as a mode. What does that mean, okay? It's a beautiful idea, what Benjamin is saying. And Benjamin's other ideas that, you know, only a poet can translate a poet. Remember, that can scare a student, right? Especially today in, in the creative writing world again, and of course, I fiercely disagree with this attitude. You know, people are taught that they're non-fiction writers and therefore they can't do poetry, okay? Or they're fiction writers and of course they're actually, you know, ignoring the fact that historically people do a lot of different things, right? But they, they get labeled that, oh, I, I can't do, I, I had a student write me this week, you know, of course I can't write poetry. And I was thinking, and therefore I can't translate poetry. <laughs> so there's this ingrained idea, all right? And Benjamin kind of lays that out, but it's good to think about. To so think about what Benjamin is saying to think. Do I agree with him? Do I disagree with him? What is he talking about, right? What does he actually say? And Benjamin also has this beautiful idea of who is the ideal, who can possibly translate certain texts. And you know, as someone who's written on the Bible for a decade, believe me, I've thought about this. Because sometimes people ask me, well, which translation do you recommend? And part of the problem with that is, you know, who do you really think is capable of translating the Bible? You know, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> who do you recommend? You know, for us, and a lot of us in this room have translated great writers, but think about it, you know, who's, who's a, a great writer? At times I see great, really great, Ask, you know, great passages in biblical translation. But honestly, I can't tell you that anyone is fabulous all the time because it's a great text. Who, so Benjamin brings that up. Who in the entire universe of readers, who's capable of doing this? But I also think that's a freeing idea for a student. You know, uh, there are some things that are above us, which I think is a great idea, right? But we try anyway, is sort of what, you know, so I think that's a great idea. And then the third person, um, so that's Benjamin, and, and, uh, and again, with Benjamin also, I find um, that students struggle at first and then get into it, okay? And that's why I recommend reading out loud, because you can stop, you can figure out what's bothering people, and you can discuss, line by line if necessary. By the time you've made it through Dryden and Benjamin, Robert Lowell is, a, is, is easy, okay? <laughs> yeah. And Lowell, of course, is much closer to our contemporary life. Most students have heard of Robert Lowell and have read Lowell. You know, actually, I will say, I, I'm disappointed to say that uh, in my most recent class, actually, no one had read Robert Lowell, which, which sort of also bothered me. Uh, but I think it's more likely that someone has read Robert Lowell than uh, uh, Benjamin, okay? That's more, more likely right now. But, um, and Lowell, as you all know, has uh, his book, Imitations. And by this point, what's awesome is everyone in the class knows that Lowell is referring to Dryden. You know, so I like that. I like that I don't have to explain it. And they know right away, okay? And they feel empowered. They understand where, where it's coming from. And we read the Lowell um, introduction to imita Imitations out loud. And as you all know, Lowell makes some radical comments. He says that he's removed stanzas, he's added things, He's changed, you know, he's done all kinds of crazy things. But what's interesting is Robert Lowell tells you what he's doing, which is helpful, okay, which is helpful. And, um, all right, so that's, that's that. And then, um, after we've had that, I find that having those three approaches laid out in the beginning offers a structure to the class and immediately gives students the feeling, or at least I hope they get the feeling, you can ask Mike if that's true, that there are at least three very different ways of doing translation, right? I want them to feel that they can choose, that there's not one, I'm very worried about giving the impression that there's one way to translate, right? I just want to show that there are a lot of possibilities and that it's personal. You have your own theory of translation, okay? And then after we read the theory, uh, we spend a week reading uh, a book I consider a political book about translation. And also I wanted to teach a contemporary book on translation because I feel that there are these, old, these are older texts, right? So I teach Edith Grossman's Why Translation Matters, right? I, I highly recommend that book. Uh, it's, first of all, it's a very easy read, especially after you've struggled through Dryden and Benjamin. It's a breeze, okay? What's, a, what's nice about um, 
Edith Grossman in terms of theory is guess what? She refers to all sorts of theoretical texts on translation. She offers her take on Dryden, on Benjamin, on Lowell. And by this point, I'm comfortable with that because I know my students, again, have had, have had the primary text experience. So they're able to, to converse with Grossman. Do I agree with Edith Grossman's take on, on uh, Benjamin? Do I not, right? That's okay. The other thing that I think Edith Grossman brings to the table is I think she articulates the passion for translation in a beautiful way. So she offers another take on what Dryden was doing. You know, Dryden says that, the overcome with the disease of translation, and Edith Grossman offers a modern take on that, right? Uh, Edith Grossman also, I feel, um, talks about you know, a lot of these political issues that, that we often discuss at Alta, the invisibility of the translator, the role of the translator in society, blah, blah, blah. But I think above all, the reason I like Edith Grossman is she makes translation contemporary. Okay? She makes it sound like this is something people do now, as opposed to this is something Dryden did. Right? So that's why I like Grossman. Okay? And so that's how I begin the class. So right now, you begin the class a couple of weeks, no translation at all, just reading theory, just reading politics. Okay? And then, I, I feel this is important, I, I feel very, very strongly that it would be absurd to have a class on translation without translating. Right? And I've seen those syllabi, which always amazes me. So just, just so that you have some idea of how I do stuff, maybe it'll be helpful to understand, I'll tell you how the rest of the class works. Okay? Uh, then we spend several weeks, every week, translate, uh, doing a translation from a particular language. Often most of the people in the class do not read it. Right? So we begin with Southos Fain's uh, poem, Fine and Moe. Then there's a Catullus poem. Uh, then I do an excerpt from the Bible. All right? And what I do is I have a student prepare a trot, okay? And I know trots are not something everyone at Alta agrees with, but again, I want to show them how people do it. You may not want to do that, but just one of the, some of the possibilities, all right? And then um, I work with the languages that the students come to me with, and it changes every time, all right? So um, this semester, for example, I'm fortunate to have a student who's doing Czech. Uh, yeah, yeah, which I don't really have no idea what's going on. Um, I also have a student this term doing Polish. Uh, I have, uh, in previous terms, I had a student doing Sanskrit. I'm just mentioning languages I don't read at all and had a struggle with. And I always say, you know, I, I show them how I do the trad in Hebrew, okay? And I, I do that. And then I encourage them, to, in the, and they also realize that there are individual ways to do a trad, right? So what we do is every week, Everybody in the class, uh, the one student comes in, presents the trot. I make sure they read out loud several times, as many times as the people in the class like. Again, I'm trying to train writers. I very much believe in reading out loud. Very, very, very much believe. And also, I don't know if my students know this, but I'm always testing out a theory from my teacher, Derek Walcott. Okay? Derek said, that a good poem you can understand even if you don't understand the language, right? <laughs> and I'm always trying to see, when all those students come in reading something from Czech, I just sit back and I listen. And I ask myself, before I look at whatever the trot is, I ask myself, is Derek right? You know, it's, a, yeah. it's like kind of fun to think of. So that's a fun, <laughs> fun teacher activity while, you, while you're at it. Um, so I ask for something short, a poem or a small piece of prose. And then, and here I'm getting back to the theory. So we do that, we workshop that every week. <coughs> Again, I want students to have a window into, we all know this historically, many people have translated when they don't know the language or don't know the language that well. I want them to see what that feels like. I want them to see if they agree or disagree. I want them to see what they can bring to Catullus, what they can bring to the Bible, okay? Because we know that happened, and, and how do you feel about that, right? And, and again, if you, if you do it yourself, your views are gonna be different than if you're reading a theoretical essay about it. So that's what I want. And then, at the same time, we spend seven weeks uh, reading um, uh, books of, in translation, literature in translation. And again, because I'm teaching nonfiction writers, I look for books um, with interesting prefaces. That's what I'm looking for, okay? And this is another form of theory, if you're looking for theory. What I have found is that m many translators, in their prefaces, write about their own personal theory of translation. And that can make fascinating classroom discussion. So I'm going to list a few that I found particularly useful. Um, Jeff Brock, who is very familiar to people at Alta, uh, Jeff Brock's first book, uh, The Collective Poems of uh, Pavese, has a, has a very interesting discussion of, of how, how he does what he does. All right? I also, I have not taught it, but I've read it. 
I can say that Jeff has a, an anthology of um, Italian poetry, I believe it's 20th century Italian poetry, also has some interesting discussion, it might work, but I've never taught that book personally, okay? I have taught the Pavese, it's an interesting preface to teach, okay, I can tell you, interesting. The other one that I think, um, and again, I'm looking for, for approaches that aren't like each other at all, uh, the opposite, I think, of Jeff Brock would be John Felstener. Uh, John Felstener, of course, is the Ceylon translator. Uh, just to be careful, Felstener has two books on Ceylon. One is um, the Selected Poetry and Prose, and one is a biography. Okay? I find both valuable, but I think if you're trying to sort of discuss how translators do what they do, the preface to the Selected Poetry and Prose is a better call. Right? And one of the things that Felstener discusses which I think is, could be a theory for that issue, is leaving some words in that of, in, of German in the text, all right? So that's interesting to hear, hear his take. Of course, it goes back to what Benjamin was saying. You can't translate, right? It goes back to that, that problem. But you can, you can see John Felsner's view. And of course, for those who haven't read that preface, it has a marvelous section of where um, Felsner is staying, Ceylon's dead, okay, sadly. Ceylon, um, Felsner is staying over in Ceylon's wife's house. And at 4 a.m., he gets up to go through Ceylon's library. And when he picks up a particular book, she says, Ceylon's wife says, you can't touch that. Right? But just to give you, I think it's a marvelous image for students on the dedication of a translator. I mean, you stay over with the wife, <laughs> the library, and it's a little excessive, but it goes back to Dryden. I, you know, I have the disease of translation. A false center can't control himself. He has, he has no, no time. It's interesting to see. All right. and then, a third one that I, that I find uh, especially helpful is uh, Peter Constantine. Peter Constantine's Babel, um, beautiful piece on translation. Also, if you want to supplement, I think Peter Constantine's interviews with Words Without Borders on what he does are also good to use. Okay? So those are those. And I can talk about others if you want. I, I teach seven straight weeks of, of translation. I look for a different language every week. Okay? Also, if you can, um, a good because uh, Michelle was talking. Michelle was talking so beautifully about looking at different translations, and you know, obviously, I've done a lot of that with the Bible. But um, I will say that the Peter, if, if you're interested in Russian, the Peter Constantine uh, book offers a great opportunity to do that if you have patience with Amazon, because there's the Lionel Trilling um, Babel, and that and to compare and contrast. Uh, that edition in Constantine is fascinating. If you need a particular piece, I recommend looking at the story of the king in both translations, Babel's famous story of the king. Uh, but also, how Trilling writes about Babel and how Trilling writes about translation is very different from how Peter Constantine does. So that can be very interesting. Just as a caveat though, the Trilling book is out of print. You can get it if you have patience on Amazon, but it's not fast. So I would say, Two to three, seriously, if you want it, order it two, two months ahead of time, and it will eventually come through. Again, for writers, because I'm teaching writers, this is why I'm thinking about this, it so happens that the Lionel Trilling uh, babble was extremely important to American fiction writers, okay? So if you find yourself, I don't know if this is a factor for people in this room, if you find yourself teaching short story writers or fiction writers, and especially fiction writers who, um, shall we say, worship the fiction coming out of the United States in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, that, that, style, that style writer, then the Trilling is an important book to get because the influence is, you can definitely see the influence, right? But if you're not teaching fiction, that's, it's, it's not so necessary, but it's important. That's why the Trilling book, I think, is important for writers, and that's, that's good to know about. Uh, let's see. And then, just, just to give you a sense of, so I think they get the theory in the beginning of the class, they get the theory from these individual writers, and then I always make sure to teach a book, a book in translation with no theory, no preface, no afterwards, just to see what that's like, okay? And to feel, I think that's also important, to feel what the absence of theory feels like, right? If you want a recommendation, I can recommend uh, Amichai's books of poems, okay? Amichai is, of course, a major, the major poet of Israel. Unreal, unreal looking at some of these editions. There are allusions, I mean, if you read Hebrew, you know that he's, he's referring to like 2,200 years of history, uh, 2,200, you know, thousands of years of biblical and medieval text, no notes, no explanation, no nothing. 
And yeah, you know, I mean, it's fine, but, but you, really, you really miss a lot, okay? And what I do sometimes is I'll pick one or two poems and I'll walk students through what they're missing, right? So that they can, they can, they can feel it. But it's interesting to read a book with nothing. So there are many examples. You know, there's many examples of a book with absolutely no uh, theoretical, no, nothing. And that's, I think I also recommend that just, as, just so you can discuss why it matters and if it matters. And then, uh, just so you know, um, my, my graduate class always ends with a large final project. What they do is between, um, uh, if it's poetry, it's, I think it's 10 to 15 pages of poetry. If it's uh, prose, it's 20 to 30 pages. And then I also require a translator's essay. The translator's essay must include some comments on your theory of translation, right? And the reason I do that, for two reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, I teach in a nonfiction program, so I have to make sure, I have to do that. Okay, there has to be an essay component to anything I do, so there you go. But also, politically, I think many people at Ulta have heard me talk about this over the years. You know, I really think it's better. I think translators should uh, try and put their writer in context, especially if you're working with a language that, you know, a language or a culture that people are unfamiliar with. Uh, just as somebody who reviews a lot of books and writes a lot about literature and translation, I can certainly say that a strong essays, yeah, yeah. a strong, I would say, theoretical or political statements have helped me understand a writer in a way I, I otherwise would not. So I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, if, um, I think that if students learn that early, uh, they begin thinking about literature as a global conversation. And that's really my goal. Like, I want, I want students to think of, of literature as a world and not as a small classroom in Chicago. I want them to think of you know, that different eras, different centuries, different languages, and different approaches are speaking to each other. And that's, my, I guess, my own favorite translation. So uh, yeah, so that's pretty good. OK, yeah. yeah. That's it for me. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> I guess we, we no, have questions for each agree. other, which is no, kind of funny. I, yeah. I th and I think we've looked at the translation as reading, and translation as writing. Right? Absolutely. So two things. Absolutely. And I think what's so important is this idea of translators as readers, as yes. the first and intense readers of a text. That's why they're so valuable. Absolutely. It's, it's not only just a theory, but actually a reading. Absolutely. Right? And, and approaching that as an, an interpretation of the text, and then do you agree with it, do you not agree, whatever. But it starts a conversation, and I think that's so important. I think so. And yeah. I will also say, after working very, very closely with the book editor, I think that you know there are very few people in the culture who read that closely. Yeah. I would say either yeah. a very devoted editor, a very yeah. devoted translator, Who's going to ask you about every comma? It's a beautiful thing, and whether or not, really, yeah. I, I feel that way. And I, you know, I don't worry about whether or not. I don't know about you, but I really don't worry about whether or not my students will become translators. Although, if I may share my nothings, okay, <laughs> I, I'm so happy. Like Micah has published his translation in several national journals here. He's uh, had. I now I think I've now had at least five, maybe six or seven students who've presented at Alta, and it's wonderful to see them publishing in, in nationally, which is fabulous. But in all honesty, that was not my goal. My goal was to introduce students to translation, make them aware that translation exists, yeah. make them comfortable with it, and make them the kinds of readers and writers that translation makes a person. So yeah. that, that's what I wanted. Yeah. That's all I wanted. Yeah. Oh, so should we open it up? Let's ask. Yeah. We, yeah. yeah. Okay, so people have questions for us. Oh, fabulous questions. Yeah. It's, it's so great to hear about both of your classes and you're both incredibly inspiring and how to bring theory into the classroom. I'm wondering if there are any essays that are on translation pedagogy that either of you find helpful, like for instance, the Nudie's idea of the remainder. If there's anything else that you could recommend in terms of uh, both thinking about translation pedagogy, but also um, possibly in offering a translation pedagogy mm -hmm. course for graduate students, for example, in comparative literature. That's a great question. God, so I, great I don't question. know. Yeah, no, it is a great question. Um, I um, pedagogy. I, yeah, if you've got a, a, mm -hmm. yeah. a, a course, that I, I teach a course called the Theory and Practice of Literary Translation. We can talk about that. One thing we need to do, of course, is share syllabi. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a great sure. idea. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying to think, I think it, it might have been the newbie who is doing an MLA volume. He is, he is. Mm. It's coming and out we, next year. The, the course that four of us designed um, was rejected from that volume because I think it was far <laughs> too like practical, maybe. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or, or self promoting, one or the other. But, but <laughs> something will be out there in an anthology within a, a year or two, I'm sure. 
Yeah, I think it's coming out next week. But we probably have collective knowledge right now that can solve that problem if we just That's actually an interesting idea. We could put some maybe Alta would Alta maybe we should do something like that. An Alta yeah, list. Yeah, Alta I would love it. An Alta yeah. anthology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great idea. And you yeah. might you might go to Rutledge instead of MLA. Well, yeah, I didn't know. Maybe a faster turnaround. Sure. No, this was somebody <laughs> else's books. this was somebody else's project and we just proposed a, a chapter there was a call. Uh, yeah. In terms of literary pedagogy, I don't think so much. I think you'll find stuff with John Benjamin's on uh, translator training in terms of interpreting uh, and machine translation, that kind of stuff, uh, localization. So that's, that's always associated with teaching. But you're, I think there's a natural dearth of work on tran uh, you know, teaching translation in a comparative literature setting, personally. I don't well, know. I I can't speak about comparative literature, but I can tell you that even though I have only taught this course twice, I have received requests from all over the world asking me about my syllabi and things yeah. like that. And you know, in Tel Aviv this summer, I, I visited a class at Bar Ilan because they, you know, they were trying to set up something like that there. So I think that there's a, I think there's a hunger for, there's a hunger for yeah. it. Like if someone's tracking you down on Facebook and asking you, it means that they can't find anything in the library. Like I think there, maybe there isn't anything to answer your question. I think it also speaks to the change, right? That um, you know, there. I mean, there are obviously dedicated translation programs, but I think increasingly with the worlding of English lit and uh, kind of the expansion, not expansion of comp lit, I think it's a mix of kind of mixing together with English lit. I think there are more people. We were talking about this who are yeah. teaching translation courses kind of under the radar, right. um, and. You know, we're saying I think that would be great to have some kind of um, community where we could share ideas and yeah. share syllabi. I think it'd be brilliant because you don't know where people are teaching it. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. You know? yeah. I think a key aspect of that um, sharing will be to demonstrate to deans and yeah. yes. uh, English yes. chairs that, yes. you know, if, uh, that the, the, you know, what is an apparently small political act to get a course approved you know, in a minor, which means that it then has to be offered every year, was in our context at Davidson, you know, an existential threat to the English department. <laughs> yeah. There's other speed as such who, uh, who, who tend to view, you know, the world of literature as kind of a map, a 19th century nation state map. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it will take, uh, I think, you know, kind of the collective experience and knowledge of groups yeah. like this to point out to a dean, you know, like, here's 27 other people at other places who think that this is a great idea for these reasons, you know, you, you, we need to get with the program yeah. um, because of the change that's happening. And, you know, at the academy, it's like such a you know, conservative institution in that way. We just hate the change thing. So the fact that I'm looking forward to this work. Yeah. I mean, it, it might feel easy to all toot our own horns and talk about how, how great translation is as a course for students to change the way they read and engage with texts because we're all translators and we're all interested. <laughs> but it's, you cited um, some of your student, Michelle, you yeah. cited some of your yeah, students' yeah. evaluations as, as great material to then defend that course's existence and yeah, get absolutely. it approved right. from another time. Right. And it potentially could be a useful exercise to cite other people's student evaluations yes. from other mm -hmm. um, institutions oh, and say, I'm, yeah. I want to model a course on this person's course. The syllabus, mm -hmm. This is the syllabus, it's run for five years. These are student evaluations. It's changed the way they view language, changed the way they view literature and writing. Yeah. And I think we need to do something similar at this institution. Because, yeah, I mean, you were talking about your courses. I teach a Spanish to English, um, mostly literary translation um, oh. workshop. <laughs> and kind of, they're very different from the courses that you were describing. But still, I saw that there's kind of a progression that, that is very similar. Mm -hmm. um, in all the courses, and it's awareness, comfort, engagement. Yes. And those are the yes. steps. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then you, uh, Avia is your name, right? Avia. Those are the words you, I wrote those down oh. halfway through your talk. <laughs> and then the very, the last two sentences you said included those words. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's because that's really what happens to students. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, and it's crucial. It's I mean, I teach undergraduates mm -hmm. who are Spanish majors, wow. and it's crucial to their um, development to critical thinkers writers Whoa. and speakers and readers. Whoa. Whoa. And I think that happens to everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. might steal your course. three words for yeah. future Alta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 
it's crucial for everybody to take a tra translation course that hasn't thought about translation before. Right. And can I just uh, say, because just a quick before, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. just quickly, uh, that I teach a lot of education, English education students, oh, and so I've seen a lot about the Common Core, and man, talk about even less fiction and even more American and more insular. So by the time we're going to get these kids at university, kids, students mm -hmm. at university, they'll have read barely anything so beyond the borders. Yeah, 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 yeah,
But you know what? The eval I can tell you the evaluations for that class were fantastic. Yeah. And I think the student, and many of them wrote that they had never, yeah. you never heard of these writers, never knew. And one of the most moving, I'll just share with you because I was <clears> so <throat> moved by, by this. Um, I had one student, you know, a graduate of the Chicago Public Schools, motivated student with a terrible education, yeah. absolutely horrible education that upset me every time I, I would just upset me so, so much. And, um, you know, he wrote that he uh, got so taken with Adam Zagajewski, I mean, how awesome is that? <laughs> <laughs> that he, he realized that he had a classmate whose grandfather was Polish. He went met with the grandfather. He wrote, he, he talk, I, I was just so moved. And the grandfather was so excited that he read it to him in Polish, okay? And I thought to myself, if he drops out next week, he still has had this yeah. fantastic experience and carry it with him for the rest of his life. So I guess I would say, you know, you're limited sometimes, you know, you're limited sometimes what you do, but you can teach a very difficult undergraduate class. My own preference is when I do that, I make the reading really, really challenging and then I lower the writing, writing component. I don't lower my writing standards, ever. I lower the writing life. And I, and I also believe, actually, that write, learning how to write a good one-page essay is great. I, I have no problem with that. But it's, it's, uh, I won't require a 15-page essay yeah. and uh, Zagajewski yeah. from someone yeah. Who's, yeah. who, in my opinion, their high school education is a seventh grade education. It's just not fair. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot that comes to mind. And I'll try to say a few things first. I don't want to say the obvious, but it's interesting that Benjamin is, of course, itself translated already. And that's right. He, that's uh, right. For example, you know, the, the, the famous art essay, uh, I always found it odd that it was translated as uh, in the age of, of technical reproduction, when yeah. it's really yeah. reproduction. Yeah. Here, archive reproducibility, yeah. which right. speaks to the idea of, in, his essay, in his essay, the translator, that it's the untranslatability is itself. And so I wonder if you, if you Go into that when you do try and bend your knees and say you're you're getting this already. I, I do, I do. Um, I, I always mention that it's a translation. Always. I think that you know, I try to mention that whenever I teach anything in translation. And I always say that if you read this language, you know, you may want to read it in the original. No matter no matter what. Actually, you know, in nonfiction programs people read a lot of Montaigne, right? And it infuriates me that it's never mentioned that it's a translation. So, yeah, I think that, that yeah. gets to the point of yeah. This is theory and this is literature. When your mm -hmm. point is, in part, for having it, reading it aloud, that it can be appreciated as it's writing. This is writing and this is writing. Right. And so I think that's in, a good, Yeah, uh, right. Good point. The other thing is, right. I, I came to a, a performing arts conservatory uh, wow. from German studies, and so mm -hmm. I, I teach there. And um, I'm considering uh, that's really when I first became interested in translation because now all of a sudden I'm teaching all this German stuff in English for the first time, and I'm really seeing them as it's seems such like a different text to me. Uh, but so I'm thinking of putting together a course on translation just as a, as a general uh, elective. Uh, and you talk about translation as reading, translation as writing, translation as performing. In other words, how you yeah. perform it's a great something. Idea. So I'd be great curious. Idea. That's why I ask everyone. I'm going to ask the two yeah. of you, of course, afterwards. But if anyone has uh, yeah, recommendations for me about theory that specifically talks about, for example, I have singers who sing the German leader in German, but of course there's a translation that goes on to them to then interpret it uh, back in the original German that isn't their original German, it's not their original language. And then of course they have you know, drama students who perform translated works and so on, and then filmmakers who, uh, screenwriters who, are, who have courses on adapting for the screen. And so the idea of translation as interpretive, performative uh, adaptation something that, again, if anyone has yeah. Uh, yeah. recommendations for me, I would yeah. love to, to have. Can I, I have yeah. to speak to that really briefly and answer Michael's question, too, because this is yeah, undergraduate. Yeah, really good person only, to answer. Yeah. Um, and brings students from different um, language backgrounds. So there's always two of us in the class. So last time it was me in the class, which was Kane Cheshire, who you might have heard of Sophocles reading every day. Oh, yeah, yeah. His homework, things yeah. like that. Um, somebody from Russia this coming spring, um, French, French on studies and Hispanic studies. And then we've got students, you know, from five or six, bringing five or six different ranks, of course. But for evaluation, so we do a blog every week. And Dip Benjamin is central to this class, all, which is, we spend a lot of time on that, and also we do others on Benjamin. But the, the um, final project is a translation with a translator's preface, which gives context to the work, but also annotations. We require, so we also read the book of 
<laughs> crazy thing on the phone. <laughs> yes, and uh, they really did it, and we think of doing annotated translation in some, some oh. semester. So we asked for these two different translator genres. One is an annotated project, a project of annotation that can take the place of footnotes or, you know, end of the, we give them a bunch of different models for those. But then also the framing essay. So one is sort of context and one is about the text. Really and that nice. whole project is about 12 pages back. Hmm. So the and, and about a third, a third, a third, depending on what genre they choose. So that works. And then for the performative thing, um, we do what we call the soir the translation soiree, and the mm -hmm. students produce a, a playbill or a chapbook, and each student gets three sheets, you know, folded half by eleven folded sheets. The original and their translation each has only you know however much fits on half the page in, in twelve point. And then a reduced version of their essay slash annotations in a page, right? So everything that they did two weeks mm -hmm. before then gets reduced in this playbill, and they all dress up and we have champagne and, oh. and they do a reading of their translation, kind of like the translation readings here. That was my first alt, and it's like, oh, you wow. do that, you know? How cool! It's like magic or something. Yeah. And so they read a small section of their their original work. And then just, you know, no more than what is like two minutes. Mm -hmm. And then a little tiny version of their thing. And it's just so affirming because they have this artifact they can take home. You know, it's beautiful, the little chapbooks, and they just buy that open. And it's very beautiful. They get completely into it as a, as a formal reading. And our creative writing colleagues are kind of like, well, you know, we do this without our permission now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that, I'm happy kind to of share the model for that and the timeline and all that. It's really yeah, successful. Right. That's good. That's good. I just wanted to add to the, yeah. the, the question of can this be done at the undergraduate level? I teach a course. Again, these are all made, these are professional, being professionally trained in drama and dance, and they just get the minimal academic to get a bachelor's degree as well. And I teach a course on, on European realism, and I, I do, we read Lukács, we read um, Todorov, we read, uh, I mean, but of course, I, I think the key is, as you say, front loading and excerpting as well. I think it's important that they see the original, but they don't have to read the yeah. entire yeah. original essay. So you excerpt and you front load with, quest with questions, and, it, and I think they, and then interleave that, as you said, you do with, with the literature, and I think it, it does, it is doable. Yeah. Even for students who, in my case, don't even read anything. Yeah. Much less English. Or there was a good essay <laughs> for just. <laughs> Just for you, I have a couple of suggestions of essays on music and wow. translation. Yeah, 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 if you, later yeah, after, yeah, 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 oh, if you want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's wonderful. One thing I like to do for my undergraduate students is lay them little traps, um, <laughs> <laughs> because if you have, if you have, I, I've never taught the graduate course, but if you taught a graduate course in translation, you had somebody produce a thirty-page uh, product, you know, this really, really big project. Um, there's a lot of material there, and they can really own it, and it's it's, it's big, you know. Um, but with an undergraduate course, you're giving them a, a, a you know mid-semester test or something. You just can't do that. You've got a lot of students. But I'll look for especially uh, maybe a poem that has two very early editions, and they're not exactly the same. Mm. And you give them maybe the title, if it's very easy to find, you give them the title and the author and the year it's from, and they have to find it, and then they get different texts, and they see there are two different versions. Mm -hmm. that's that's yeah. And this is the political problem, and this is right. the, 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 the men are aware of how texts get taken up and, and published, but then they have to do this performative thing of deciding and coming up with a solution, and they're getting immersed in the whole problem, textual history, history. Uh, so I, I, I give him this Vallejo poem that has this line that says, Lentas asias amarillas de vivir. And he's talking about it's about blood. It's, it's kind of uh, genealogy and, and um, you know, the circulatory system. And the asias amarillas de vivir is in some other version, ansias amarillas de vivir. And it's very different. Obviously, in English, we go, uh, if, it's, if it's yellow Asias, then we've got maybe a racist problem like in English, it's a very strange thing. And if it's ansias, it's something else. And it's that N, and nobody knows which one is the, the manuscript's gone, and there are, there are early editions of the poem in both, nobody knows. And so a translator really has to decide. A, I mean, you're, you're gonna produce a, an edition of Vallejo in Spanish, and you just kind of put a footnote and say, two very different readings, there's an N or there isn't an N. But, 
major translator just got to choose, and that's a very formal thing. For an undergraduate, it's only one line. That's the, that's the problem yeah. at home. Like, no. that's a lot of problems. But that's one big thing. And they say, that's the test. Go, go nuts. Mm -hmm. um, little things like that. <coughs> wow. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. More questions? <laughs> I mean, just a practical yeah. question. So to begin to organize some thinking about this, maybe for panels next year and for a syllabus database, and yeah. you know the idea of a volume or position papers, would the best entry for that just be to send something to the list, the Alta list, to start together? To, well, to this work faculty meeting, I'd say that's a great idea. You know. Oh, I mean, I, I, mean, <laughs> I got to show you know for my dean, and the, the, my colleague in English, who I really like, but it's just. Second time. Yeah. I have um, never used the Alta list or personally. I have never used it. Yeah. I, I, I have I never used it. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, I'd be happy to, to demonstrate to, to my home crew yeah. that there's, you know, people are think smart people are talking about this. <laughs> and at least gesture towards starting to organize things. Yeah. But would that be the way to do it is my question. What's the I think it's a good start. I think to have some sense of who's teaching right. where yeah. and right. something. Yeah. So everybody on the list. Yeah. 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 You know what the bare minimum Automatically, right? Scott, you know what I'm thinking at a bare minimum would be great to have, and I think we can probably do this when you register for the conference, is maybe to ask, do you teach a translation course? Yeah. yeah. Where? Yeah. What's it called? Yeah. Is it undergraduate or graduate? Because yeah. I think it's fair to say not everyone at Alta teaches a translation right. course, yeah. right? And if we just, even if we knew, I don't even know, but let's, I mean, I'm, I have a vague idea of how many graduate programs in yeah. translation yeah. are yeah. in the United States, yeah. Yeah. sometimes yeah. students ask me. Yeah. But, but beyond that, I, you no know, idea. I don't know if anyone knows, so maybe Alta can do that. When you register, do you teach a class? Where is it? What's it called? Is it undergraduate or graduate? Would you be willing to share a description, book list, syllabi? What? But that would, that would be, um, actually, Erica Mina could ask Erica to add that to, to next year's. Uh, I think that would be very interesting. And then you could go to your dean and you could say, there are 30. And that, it might be shocking, too. I, I have a feeling the number might be shockingly low how many translation courses right. there actually are in this country. Right. And, well, and what percentage are... Yeah. Course, for example, it would you know, not necessarily come so up. Really the thing is, you'll see it, but it's not part of the translation exactly. program. It's yeah. something right. that... Right. Same so with yeah. My yeah. boss is defended fiercely, and, right. the guy, and now the, and the students love it, so we're adding more, more right. sections. Right. Right. It's great. Right. But that's just a, an elective mismanagement. Yeah. Yeah. It right. doesn't go beyond that. Right. Right. Okay. Because right. I, I think you're right. I don't think there's any data on that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. It's very inspiring. I took a lot of notes and there's still a lot of your ideas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> steal away. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, when, you, when you have students translate, do you ever do team translation and also do you talk about editing at all? Is this for me or for oh, everyone? For you, you know, that's, a, that's a great question. So far, I have not had any students work on a team translation. I have not. I do talk about, so that, that's a good point. That's a good point. I think I probably try and mention that there were teams throughout history. You know, I talk about the Pavir, you know, I, I talk yeah. about some of those. Um, but now that I think about it, that's a good point. I don't think I have any teams on my, but let me take that back. I have a team, uh, I teach on the Chana Bloch, um, uh, what's the other lady? The two Chanas, Bloch and Kronfeld, to do Amichai. So I teach, teach that. Actually, Amichai is a very interesting poet to teach if you're interested in translation because he's had so many different translators and you can compare and contrast. Ted Hughes translated Amichai, Derek Walcott translated Amichai, and then you can look at two, uh, you know, the two, uh, he's a Hebrew scholar, so, you know, Hannah Kronfeld who teaches at Berkeley. So I do that. So that's a team, uh, team, team translation, but, I, but you're, you're right. I probably should discuss that a little more. Um, I do discuss editing, and I'll tell you how. And now I realize I didn't mention that in my description of the course, but it's important. Forget about that. I have visitors, okay? I have uh, work distinguished translators I admire come and visit. Uh, Jason Grunbaum, who's a big Alta person, came to speak with my class. I also always invite an editor and I try for more. So Susan Harris came to class, mm -hmm. and so she can talk. She talks about. So that's what I do. I have an editor come in and talk about it, um, and. Uh, the invitation is open. If anyone's going to be in Chicago over the next four weeks on a Monday, please let me know. I'm happy to <laughs> see my class is uh, one to five. This year has been difficult with the timing of, of Alta, but yeah. So what I do is I have editor visits. Okay. So I don't know if I answer his question. So yeah. Add something to that. Sure. Uh, the program at the University of Iowa, the International Writing Program, every fall they've got writers from all over the world who come in mm. and 
they're available to go anywhere in the country oh, during the oh, month. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. If you, I mean, you have to pay their transportation, put them up, but then it's a really cheap wow. reading. Yeah. Um, I've used them several times at Texas Tech, wow. where I pay for the flight, actually put them up in my house. <laughs> uh, but then also, but then also, because they don't have work visas, you find different ways to pay them. So maybe a, a what is it like one of those one hundred dollar credit cards that you can buy, you know, like where they right. can right. use that. Does but your, they're they're fabulous. Sorry. Does your dean do your accountants go for gift cards no. for no. honorary? So that's sometimes I gather money from all over the place okay. to, to Smart. do those things. But <laughs> but what I use oh. them in my translation workshops. Wow. Even though we may not be reading the material, but yeah. we have yeah. someone come in who's been yeah. translated, who will read work in the original and in translation. Wow. But then they're they're actually you know this writer from <laughs> say Nigeria, wow. you would never be able to pay yeah. to to invite you. But they're already here. But they're already here. So you're right. bringing them from Iowa, yeah. right? It can be expensive, but it's not as expensive. That's as such a marvelous idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I can say, you know, Curse have both both looked at my city, graduate, those, those were the marvels. I mean, they're, they're hand-picked by their governments to, to represent the country, so they're, they're usually very talented. Uh, what are they there? They're from August, late August to so, early November. Yeah. Early November, yeah. So marvels. it has to be in the fall, yeah. and usually you find out, uh, what is it, I think maybe late July, who the writers are, it's usually up on the book. Yeah. But and Christopher I'm, Merrill is the director mm -hmm. of the right, right? So tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That is such a fabulous idea. <coughs> fabulous edition. Thank you. Wow. Anything Hello. else? Anyone? No, last call. Okay, well, Michelle, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>